Welcome to this introduction on exercise physiology principles. In this video, as you can see, we discuss the five principles or laws that really govern all our exercising efforts and outcomes. So let's get started. The first principle speaks to the one of the body's five major functions, which is responsiveness, if you can recall. And the principle of responsiveness is one of the most, captures one of the most unique features of biological organisms. And that's the fact that, you know, not only can we recover from a, uh, stress. We can um, heal from injury and infection. Not only can we do that, but we actually can become better and adapt um, and become stronger as a result of that. So we really are anti-fragile. And so the responsiveness principle speaks to our anti-fragility, that we, if we are going to become something different, something new, we have to undergo um, you know, some kind of transformation. And that transformation uh, includes, you know, in this case, you know, controlled doses of stress and micro trauma and injury, obviously not infection, um, for us to become better. And so there are three concepts related to the principle of responsiveness that uh, speaks to this transformation. And it really is, represents what I call the stimulus response cycle, meaning in order for us to undergo a positive physiological adaptation, whether that's in strength or muscle and fat loss or cardiovascular uh, fitness, um, we need to expose the body to a stress response pattern unique to the adaptation that we want. Um, then we need to uh, remove the stimulus, the stress response, recover and repair, which is what we call acute adaptation. And then if we do that multiple times over long period, periods of time, then we have a chronic adaptation. So for example, um, actually the next slide shows this. So we undergo a stress response like we, when we exercise and assuming that the stress response was intense and long enough, then it will stimulate what we call an adaptive response. We will repair and recover from that adaptive response given enough recovery and then we'll over undergo an adaptation. Obviously what you're seeing here is not, you know, we don't obviously uh, grow that much muscle in a single stress response. So this would represent a, 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 a single stimulus response cycle, but imagine, um, you know, uh, we accumulate multiple stimulus, respe stimulus response cycles over long periods of time, and the body will start to change if we expose ourselves um, to that particular type of stress pattern um, frequently uh, and consistently enough. Okay. Next, we've got progressive overload. So remember, we just talked about the fact that if the body is going to um, undergo a po positive physiological adaptation where we get stronger, where we get fitter, where we, uh, you know, our, our, our bodies become leaner, then uh, we need to have a stress response that actually is going to be intense and long enough. And so overload really is this exercise-induced disruption in our homeostasis, right, the acute response of the body, um, that should be intense and long enough to trigger this adaptive response in, the body's in our body's functional abilities which again is the acute adaptation. So we exercise, that's the acute response. Remember what's the, remember our heart rate increases, blood pressure rises, um, you know, body fluid changes, blood pH, uh, you know, changes. All these changes is a response, is the acute response to a stress. And in this case, it's either gonna be, you know, resistance training or it could be cardiovascular training, or it could even be stretching, but there's some kind of a stress response. Um, and again, if it's intense and if it's long enough, then um, it would be adequate to stimulate an adaptive response. Progressive overload then means we adjust the exercise intensity to match our rate of improvement, right? So every time we get stronger, so really the, the word overload is not accurate because we're never overloading ourselves. We're actually loading the body to our maximum capability because just past our maximum capability, you know, is the flirting with injury. And so we never really go past that point. So we never really overload. We could say we maximally load the system. Um, and if we don't maximally load the system, we will not stimulate an adaptive response that we want. And we can either, you know, and this, we can either stimulate an adaptive response in terms of our neuromusculature, our uh, bioenergetics, our energy systems, and our biomechanics, and usually a combination of all three. And so progressive overload just means that we're overloading the body, or actually we're maximally loading the body today, and then we recover the acute, uh, the, the acute adaptation, 
And then once we've recovered, we actually become a little bit stronger, which means if we go do the exact same workout that we did before, it doesn't feel as bad, it's less intense, uh, we can actually do more. And so we need to match the intensity back to our current uh, new baseline um, you know, level of strength. This image here beautifully captures the concept of progressive overload. Of course, we have the Greek, ancient Greek wrestler Milo of Croton here, who was thought to have carried his own calf um, you know, every single day, and that as his calf grew, he would become as strong, his strength would grow in proportion to the size of the calf, um, allowing him to carry a full-fledged bull um, by the time he was older as well as um, a bull. One of my favorite quotes is by Arthur Jones, also speaking to the principle of progressive overload. It is simply impossible to build muscular size or strength by performing that which you're already capable of doing. You must constantly attempt the momentarily impossible and such attempts should involve maximum possible efforts. Absolutely. Now this doesn't mean every workout, especially if you train three or four or five times a week, but again if you're doing 10x you're training once or twice a week, but um, this doesn't mean that you, uh, you know, overload, or maximally load your body every single time you train. But it does mean that if you are serious about stimulating that adaptive response, you have to go at minimum towards the edge of your capabilities or try to go slightly beyond them without injury um, if we are going to be con continuously uh, pushing our um, maximum capabilities. There are four very important things that we have to consider when it comes to the progressive overload principles. Things to always keep in mind when it comes to um, constantly stress the body, maximally load it to produce an adaptive response. All biological adaptations are subject to logarithmic growth as opposed to exponential growth. You see there are two types of growth. Exponential means that you see slow growth and eventually growth just shoots up, so it's almost exponential and almost as if it doesn't end. That's not true of biological systems. In fact, what you see with biological systems, physiology, you see rapid improvement and then we start to see it slow down and then eventually it plateaus, meaning we don't see any, any progress. It's important to understand that because this, if you hit a plateau, it doesn't mean you're on the wrong program. You're hitting a plateau because you're starting to approximate your genetic potential. The closer you get to your genetic potential for a particular variable, a particular adaptation, okay, the more overload resistant you become to that program for that adaptation. So that means you'll have to spend way more time, you'll have to change many of the variables of your program in order to get there. But that's very time consuming and most people are kind of um, satisfied with the amount of growth that they can get with the, let's say, amount of time that they're willing to put in. No one wants to necessarily reach their potential genetic potential for a particular variable. That can be like a lifelong endeavor. But it's important to understand, however, despite the fact that we have a genetic cap, you always want to show up as if you don't. You train as if you don't have a limit, but you always, in the back of your mind, you are a reasonable person knowing that um, you can't grow infinitely, so you put your expectations in context. Okay, so um, adaptation window speaks to the fact that, again, as you, we reach our genetic potential, that is the window, the difference between where we are and our genetic ceiling, that's the um, adaptation window. And the more, we, the more that window closes, again, the more uh, complex uh, the training variables have to become for us to completely close that window, which we already discussed. And so this basically, um, you know, leads us to make certain trade-offs, right? We say, okay, I'm not going to reach my genetic potential for this particular variable. Let's say it's maximum strength, um, but then I get to spend more time on other things like cardiovascular endurance or, you know, extreme flexibility. And in some cases, you can achieve or approximate your genetic potential for, let's say, strength, flexibility, and endurance. Um, but again, your whole life will probably have to revolve around exercise in order to do that. So this image here illustrates what I was saying. So on the uh, vertical axis here, we have the rate of adaptation, and then we have the horizontal axis here, the time in months. And so we see rapid growth in the first uh, year, and then we start to slow down after about two years. Um, again, this graph is not particularly accurate for 10x specifically, uh, but this is a, a graph that is um, very representative of strength as an adaptation. And so here we have 
uh, rapid growth and then we start to slow down approximating our genetic potential and you see here this graph illustrates the fact that the need for um, training complexity uh, you know grows in proportion to the rate at which we close our um, adaptation window here is basically the adaptation lifespan so imagine that this this the horizontal axis here represents time but in terms of life stages rather than um, months let's say as a 20 year old you could um, get as strong as you possibly can um, and maybe through your 30s and 40s you know reach your you know strength potential um, relative to the amount of time that you're putting in um, and then no matter what we do after, after a long period of time as we age between the age of 50 and 60 we will start to decline no matter if we uh, you know, no matter how complex the training stimulus becomes okay so now we move on to the principle of reversibility so the reversibility principle is the idea that well as its name suggests that we return back to a preconditioned baseline state absent continuous exposure to the same exercise stimulus right so um, as we get stronger and stronger and stronger, if we remove the strength training stimulus or as we get more and more flexible, as we remove the stretching stimulus, we tend to return back towards a baseline state. It kind of sucks, right? Because it means we're doomed to continuously expose the body to this um, stimulus to retain uh, those uh, adaptive capabilities. So the question then becomes, um, okay, so if most of the accrued adaptations that we've accumulated over our training career reverses slowly towards a, a preconditioned baseline state. What's the minimum we have to do to keep reversibility at bay? That's number one. And number two, um, right, what's, what's the minimum to, let's say, stay healthy? And what's the minimum to, let's say, maintain and hold on to, let's say, our peak uh, fitness level? So looking at this slide again, assuming this line represents a conditioned state, so it's above a healthy baseline state, meaning we're, we're you know, fitter than the average person, we expose the body to a certain stimulus, let's say it's a strength training stimulus, where we fatigue the body deeply enough to stimulate an adaptive response, and um, provided we get sufficient recovery, uh, the difference between this pre-stressed um, state and now our recovered state would uh, we have been sufficient to stimulate an adaptive response. Now we're a little bit fitter, a little bit stronger. Uh, but again, and then the reversibility principle um, demonstrates here that a removal of that stimulus over a long enough period of time means we actually go back towards this conditioned state and towards a completely um, healthy baseline state where we started. Next, we move on to the second last principle known as the principle of specificity. Okay, so this principle states that the adaptive response is highly specific to the structural, metabolic, and movement demands of our exercise. Okay, this has multiple implications because this is, means that if the body only adapts in the way that we use it, it begs the question then, well, how should we use it? Because if it's not as transferable as we used to think, because it's not, meaning if I train my balance on a bozo ball, I, re I quickly discover that it's at, like if I, you know, try to do, let's say, tightrope walking or slacklining, um, they don't transfer. It's like I have to learn the, the skill of balance on the slack line like from scratch, just like any beginner. So they're not as transferable as we used to think. I mean, obviously there's some general foundation with which you can have a better advantage, but it's not as straightforward. So, um, and it's the same with strength. So for example, let's say you learn how to build strength um, in a squat with a barbell it doesn't perfectly translate to other activities. Although, of course, you do bring with it a foundation of strength to other activities. So it really begs the question, if the body only adapts in the way that you use it, how should we use the body? Which is a problem that I try to solve in the next couple of slides. But remember, the body, you, you adapt in three specific ways. So every exercise program um, really is nothing but a stress pattern. An exercise or an exercise program is a stress pattern that you expose the body to over long periods of time so that you can produce a specific adaptation. And those stress patterns uh, are, come in three categories, neuromuscular, bioenergetics, and biochemical. It's really the same thing of saying structural, metabolic, and movement. It means that the exercise that you do will have a 
um, muscle fiber and a neuromuscular component to it. It will have an energy system component to it, and it will have a movement pattern associated with it. And that the adaptation is very specific to all three at the same time. So let me give you an example. So in this image, as you can see, the actual movement pattern is identical. The only difference is the speed at which you train. So both of these athletes here are runners, essentially, but the one trains and runs very, very fast, which means he uses a different energy system. He uses an anaerobic energy system, and the marathon runner here uses an aerobic energy system. And again, when you use the aerobic energy system, you're using type 1 muscle fiber, um, which are our smaller, slow-twitch muscle fibers, whereas the sprinter uses predominantly type 2, fast-twitch, really strong, really big uh, muscle fibers. And again, the more you use them, the more the body will adapt to express them and so again the, the question I ask you here is how would you like the question you need to be thinking of is how what do I want to look like how strong do I want to be how flexible do I want to be what what endurance capacity do I want to possess and so you will need to always look for a stress pattern a program that will uh, basically stimulate the neuromuscular bioenergetic or biomechanical patterns of the adaptations that you see. On the right hand side we see an image um, that is essentially identical to the one on the left but just for females so you can see it's the same in both genders. Now there are three specificity domains that really solves the problem of transferability meaning remember if the adaptations that we accrue in response to a specific type of exercise program is highly specific to the way that we move, then it really, again, it begs the question then, how can we exercise or move that will have the most transference to other types of activities? And for me, it's quite simple. The more, the closer the exercise mimics our foundational or functional movement patterns, the more transferable they'll be. So the foundational uh, domain speaks to the fact that at the very minimum, you don't have to train for sports or to try to fulfill your physical potential, let's say like someone like me. But at minimum, you want to exercise in a way that mimics the basic functional and foundational movement patterns um, that prepare you and that keep you fit for your basic activities of daily living, right? And you'll be surprised that this doesn't require much at all. In fact, a basic squat, pull up, push up, basic stretching, and maybe a little bit of walking takes care of that. But again, most people aren't going to be happy with the minimum. And also, if you really are interested in longevity, you want to become as fit as you possibly can because the degree to which you can, uh, the fitter you are, the more we can delay the decline of, uh, um, of our uh, physiological abilities. So the next domain is what I call the specific domain, that we want at least the basic foundational uh, uh, fitness and preparedness for life, our activities of daily living, but then also maybe for our specific sport or our hobby. Next, obviously, um, if you want to go, you know, all the way and fulfill your potential, you want to focus on what I call integrated optimal physical development. And in fact, when you do focus on this, you basically take care of uh, your foundational fitness and even your sports training, sports specific um, conditioning. Of course, you'd need to still, uh, you know, spend some time practicing the skills that are highly specific to your sport or your hobby. But when you focus on integrated optimal physical development, you will have the highest transfer specificity um, of any type of training. And uh, of course, 10X doesn't provide you with all of that, but it gives you the best foundation for both the foundational category, your uh, sports specific uh, conditioning, and of course giving you a foundation to pursue your physical potential. This image here illustrates that again for just basic fitness do a squat. Here is almost like it's the same as number one doing a squat but doing a squat and learning how to uh, generate a lot of force or power coming out of the squat maybe because you're a you know, basketball player or a high jumper or whatever the case may be but you can basically see you know basic fitness to something more specific and then integral would be taking it all the way. Um, you know, taking the squat to its uh, complete and final integral conclusion.
Last but not least, we have what we call the individuality principle. Now, the individuality principle is very similar to the specificity principle in the sense that your the, the magnitude of adaptation and the rate at which you adapt is highly specific to your training history, your age, gender, genetic profile, and other variables, right? And so the only way for you to really know what type of uh, response you'll have to a program is obviously to be on the program long enough to see. However, you, we don't have all the time in the world for you to, let's say, give every program a year to see how you respond. So you will have to use basic um, logic to guide your decisions in choosing a program that will help you express your potential regardless of what response type you are. And so there are three types of responders. You're either going to be an average responder, which means that um, if you're an average responder and the average person, let's say, for a three-month strength training program will pick up, you know, two to three kgs of muscle, will improve strength by 25 to 30 percent as a beginner, you can pretty much expect the same. But then you get people who are hyper responders that they get way more results. They usually are, you know, they maybe get four, they pick up four kg of muscle or they improve by 50 percent. And then you get hyper responders, people who, again, being exposed to the exact, exact same exercise stimulus doesn't respond as well. Maybe they only lose one kg of fat, pick up one kg of muscle, only develop 10% of strength. And so you don't know what type of responder you are until you've been on the, uh, the same program for a long enough period of time. So this graph illustrates the different types of responders. So again, so... The blue here represents what we call the average responders, but you can basically expect to achieve um, what is pretty much average over a certain period of time for a particular type of exercise program. And it's usually about six, represents 68% of people. And these people, they vary minimally, you know, between each other. So there's almost no variability between uh, the the magnitude and rate of um, adaptation. And then the red here is represented by about 27% of people will, will vary quite noticeably that either they won't respond w as well, again, assuming that they do everything you tell them to do, um, you get people that about 13.5% of people literally who don't uh, respond as well, and then you get uh, people who respond really, really well, and it's quite noticeable. Then you get in the green, you get people who respond um, like uh, quite significantly compared to the average person. And so here you can see that about you know five percent of people uh, will either be, uh, or let's say two point three percent of people here uh, will really uh, take a long time to see the same rate of growth uh, uh, as compared to the average responder. And likewise, you get people. Who just so much as look at a you know machine or an exercise and they adapt or they lose weight and they pick up muscle it almost seems unfair but again these people exist and so these people in green represent people who you know vary quite significantly compared to the average person the next image illustrates this point beautifully what you're looking at here are world-class gymnasts who've been exposed to the exact same training stimulus for the exact same period of time, and yet they produce very different body types. On the left here, you have Kenzo Shirai, who is a Japanese gymnast, uh, and as, as you compare him here with uh, Arthur De La Loya, one of my favorite gymnasts, you can see their bodies are completely different, and even uh, a more illustrative image is these two American gymnasts who are on the exact same program and again look at how differently their bodies respond to the exact same training stimulus. However, uh, to be fair, their performance in terms of strength and flexibility are almost identical. That's just why they are world class. So in closing, the three things I want you to keep in mind when it comes to individuality principle is the fact that just because you are not responding as quickly as you would like to your program doesn't mean you're on the wrong, wrong program. It probably means or it could mean that you are a hypo responder. You don't respond um, at the same, with the same magnitude or at the same rate as the average person. Likewise, if you're someone who adapts very quickly, uh, and you know with great effect that doesn't mean that the program that you've selected is the best program either it just means that well you no matter what you do is you're going to respond really uh, quickly 
So this brings us to the last consideration, which means is how do you know what type of responder you are? Now, you will not know what type of responder you are until you've exposed yourself to an exercise stimulus long enough and consistently enough and compare yourself to other people who have done the same to see and compare your results to theirs to see to know more or less what type of responder you are and until then you don't know what type of responder you are and so the best tools you have in your toolkit is to have a very deep uh, and basic understanding of these principles so you can select the program that you think will give you the best response possible in the shortest period of time and we believe that 10x is that program because remember 10x doesn't produce better greater results faster it produced probably the same results compared to um, other solid traditional resistance exercise programs it just does so in 10 to 20 percent of the time